with David J. Maloney. This week, David talks with singer, songwriter, and pop icon, Hathaway. And now, here's your host, David J. Maloney. Welcome to everyone at home, and I would normally say our studio audience to the weekly show. I am your host, David J. Maloney. Uh, I say normally because we'd usually shoot the show before a small studio audience at the Hard Rock Hotel and Casino, uh, but we are still shooting from home due to coronavirus concerns. Uh, we do hope to gain clearance to get back to our live to tape shows real soon. In Mankato, Minnesota, a movie theater manager was arrested for selling four tenths of an ounce of cocaine hidden in a bag of popcorn. It is alleged an undercover officer paid the manager $100 for the bag, which is the current street value for a small bag of movie theater popcorn. Bad boys, bad boys. And in Mansfield, Ohio, a tenant who was evicted from his home moved out and stole the toilet. Cops at the crime scene said they had nothing to go on. Bad Oh, and did you hear this? New York City has announced it is going to stop prosecuting prostitution and unlicensed massage. So now, both the customers and the sex workers can get off. Let's see, according to a new study, baldness doubles a man's risk of suffering severe COVID. Uh, unfortunately, doctors say the virus can't be fooled by framing the top of my head out of my pictures and commercials. Bill and Melinda Gates are getting divorced. Uh, rumor has it, Bill's unit didn't have much RAM, and his PowerPoint was operating Microsoft. <music> Lastly, according to the National Enquirer, Rob Kardashian is determined to slim down to revive his TV career. They say that being overweight can be a big disadvantage in show business, especially when you can't act, dance, or sing. Our guest on tonight's show is a musical artist who helped define a decade. His 90s worldwide hit, What Is Love, had a rebirth after being featured in the movie A Night at the Roxbury. And it's still being played regularly at sporting events and in dance clubs. We have Hadaway on the show with us tonight, so don't go anywhere, and we'll be right back. And we are back. Uh, our featured guest tonight is one of the quintessential artists of the 90s. Uh, his hits What is Love and Life firmly lodged into the collective consciousness of the decade, and for good reason. Uh, he made fantastic music. Um, he's here with us tonight to chat about uh, all that music and his story. Please give a warm Wiggly Show welcome to Hadaway. Hattie, welcome to the show. Hi there, how are you? We are Thanks doing just fine. I'm Thank sorry? You. I said, thanks for having me, first of all. Thank we are you. so happy to have you. So um, a little bit before th this recording, we got to talk a little bit uh, uh, and chat a little bit. And we were talking a little bit at one point about your, your mom and, and dad. Can you, what were they like and, and how did that um, come into, were they supportive of your creativity and your music? Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, my mother was this uh, the typical uh, nurse. She was uh, always always working the long shifts and all of that, and always you know nursing. And my father was the marine biologist who was always around the world, you know, working for Shell International. Very busy man. He loved that I played the trumpet and all of that, but he wasn't really impressed that I wanted to make music. Actually, I did really know that I wanted to make music in the young years, anyway. So. Did did they so did they try to encourage creativity or was there a different direction they wanted you to go in or was that or did you find your 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 space in a special place? I, I, I mean, there was no one irritating me and I wasn't irritating anyone. Playing the trumpet was quite loud, so I had to put a, a stem mute in and just go in the corner. But um, I, I I was kind of the nerd child and I had a great deal of um. My father supported me, but more for the education, not for the music. When did you start taking up singing and performing? I mean, and what sparked that desire specifically? I used to hide in the closet when I was a little boy and sing to everything. Everything I heard on the radio, I have, I have this strangeness about me. I can sing about 6,000 songs without thinking about it. The words just pop in. Everything, you know, uh, the, the glory days way from about age seven, eight years old to about 35, whatever came on the radio, you knew it right away, you know, without rehearsing it. So uh, when your parents separated, you were kind of 
forced into becoming kind of a man of different cultures and places. What memories stick out to you about those those times? Well, you know, um, you're rushed into different cultures. You're rushed, rushed into different languages. You're rushed into so, so many new things that you, um, well, you don't want to sound like a fool. So you want to learn the language fast. You want to know what's in, what's not in. And, uh, for example, what in the United States in the, in the, in the 80s wore baggies, Europe was already tight. And, you know, uh, you know, in the States you had the, uh, the swim trunk culture where you, you shouldn't wear a Speedo, if you understand what I mean. Yeah. <laughs> all, all of those things, there was a massive difference. And um, I was busy catching up when I got to the States learning about what soul and what, what funk and things was because I didn't have it on the European continent. And um, the brush of Caribbean culture that I got from Calypso and all of these things, I didn't really, I didn't really know too much. I, I was kind of swimming in a, a Euro-English kind of culture clashing with an American culture. And um, I mean, I didn't mind because when you were young, this is something great. This is something very cool. Now, you, you've spoken often about tolerance as one of the things most important to you. Do you think that your years of traveling between cultures kind of influenced that? Definitely, definitely. Um, look, um, when you come somewhere new, you can't bully the people. You can't force your way in. You have to be tolerant. You have to wait. And uh, it's, it's like our society today. Um, nothing has changed. We, we have to step back. and Everyone has their perspective. Everyone has their point of view. Everyone has their opinion. And just because it doesn't agree with your opinion, that doesn't mean you have to shoot them. You know, you just you have to sit down and work it out or go and decide when no one is looking and just talk to each other. Get it done. And that's how I that's how I got through it. In the beginning, I was a bit more forceful myself, um, but um, I didn't get far fast. Now, who are some of the artists you wanted to be like or looked up to when you first started? Oh, from Led Zeppelin to uh, Elton John, there was everything in the middle. I mean, uh, well, on the American side, I fell in love with uh, Bruce Springsteen, Bob Seger. Um, I can tell you so many names. It, it's crazy. And on the, on the European side, it was uh, Bowie. It was Elton John. It was, it was from psychedelic sounds from uh, uh, Peter Gabriel to funky sounds like Bootsy Collins. There was everything happening. Was uh, so you so you have all these different influences. At some point, you end up in a genre that I guess some people would consider more Euro dance. How did that kind of transition come about? Because you're the names that you're throwing out there, like Bruce Springsteen and Led Zeppelin, don't necessarily you know square up exactly with the genre that you're known for now. It's actually crazy. You have to find a niche and have to create a type of music where I can never compete with some of these great artists. So you have to learn from what's actually out there. If, if you look back and see, there was already fusions already occurring when you look at uh, Lionel Richie and, and uh, Kenny Rogers. That was, that was an amazing fusion. And you look through the years, I always borrowed and I always followed individuals. Pop music remains pop music. Country music remains pop country music until you change the melodies, until you change the rhythms. You can do whatever. You know, you, you can... If, if, if I want to say, well, baby, don't hurt me, it's a very normal thing. Mm -hmm. But if I want to say, baby, don't hurt me, don't hurt me no more. What is love? You can put whatever melody, uh, take that melody and put whatever beat or whatever tempo you'd like on it, whatever groove, you can make whatever you wish. So so speaking of what is love, uh, what was the road to your first album like? Well, a uh, mate of mine, Alex Strasser, he could not, Alex Street, it's a German name, Strasser, and um, he uh, needed to pay the bills. And we were in a small studio of a company called Coconut Records. And, uh, well, the song, what is love was half of it. It was already in, in conception, but it was like, uh, a Joe Cocker yard birds, very slow ballad. And I was just busy working with, with a very good friend of mine who had just finished doing snap rhythm of the dancer. Michael Munzik is his name. So now I've got this, this, now I've got this version of what is love 
going through my head. <laughs> well, you can even grunge it, you know? Yeah, exactly. The Joe Cocker it. You know? <laughs> so, so um, which came first, the lyrics or the music? And, and what was that process like? Well, the music came first. Uh, and I dropped like uh, in about two hours, about six different melodies. And uh, even the simple... I was busy listening to a singer called Howard Jones. Oh. Who, yeah, exactly. And he made a track also, What is love? Yes. Love anyway. Does anybody love anybody Funny anyway? Anyway, yeah. Oh, I just had to have it. And um, I thought, what makes his music so special? And he had these amazing synthes. He had these oh, amazing oh. synthes that were just... You knew, you remember 25, 30 years ago when a song started, the intro, you didn't have to know that. You knew the intro right away. Yeah, oh the, the hook, if it had a hook too. If it had a hook, you were in. Intro, boom. And I, I know that song. Today mm -hmm. it's like, no, that sounds like, you know, that sounds like, it's different. <laughs> yep. But like I said, the music first, the, the text we did later. And um, yeah, to make it not fall so much that, I did everything. Um, we were a three-man writing team, and we had a lot of fun. Great. So what did you think when you heard What is Love when it was mixed for the first time, when it was, when, when it was finished? Did, it just, did you just know right away, like, okay, this is going to go somewhere? No, I didn't. Um, at first, I was kind of mad because I wanted more of my way. And I thought... Well, I was right anyway. I hate <laughs> to say it, but unfortunately, it's that way. Um, I thought that we should not attack um, to go too pop or to go too dance. We have to find a middle road where we could get um, the typical sing-along, you know, and uh, question and answer. And uh, I, j I just wanted to be not too extreme on, on either side. And it, it worked at the end, you know, it, it came out correctly. Oh yeah. I mean, it, it became a, a smash hit and, and was kind of quintessential to almost everything nineties, especially in the Eurodance circuit. Um, when, when you look back on the, on, on that particular decade, is there anything that kind of sticks out to you or maybe a touring memory that always, that, that kind of always sticks out to you when you're sharing stories of your time on the road? The scariest thing always on the road uh, at that time today it's different because it's it's now it's i am hadaway but back then it was like i am hadaway <laughs> very nice to meet you and uh and you were just running into all these monsters these amazing artists and uh one day it's elton john it's the next day you're just sitting next to i used to go down to desmond child's home in miami great songwriter amazing desmond child and on his sofa is john bon jovi um, Steven Tyler and all of these guys, and it's like, hi. <laughs> wow. Well, at that point, you either go, I fit in or I don't fit in, and you might as well choose to fit in, right? I mean... Well, there was very little to say because, um, you know, Clive Davis sent me down to Desmond, and uh, he said, look, this is one of the best uh, songwriters in the world, and uh, make it happen. And we made it happen. Now, we were talking a little bit bef before this taping about how when you first came to the States, things were a little different because y y there was a certain, maybe from a musical standpoint, that you were expected, just based upon your skin color, to maybe perform a different style? Well, it's actually funny. You know, I'm, I'm going to tell you a joke. Howard Stern in New York City. I get to New York City, get to Howard Stern show. And uh, speaking with his lovely receptionist, she's quite funny. And, and I go into the studio and we're live on the air immediately. And Howard says, hey, I thought you were a white guy. <laughs> <laughs> and we all laugh because it's funny. And you know how, how it is. He's just yeah. there. And um, yeah, I, I, I did not really... Um, it was kind of it was kind of a very eye opening situation because um, coming from all these different cultures, I wasn't really confronted where your your certain skin complexion that you have to have make a certain type of music, and um, yeah, I mean at that time I was following bands like Living Color also, and they were just a great rock band. You know, it wasn't based on color; they made just good music. 
And uh, I, I, I was pretty shocked. But um, look, you get over it, you know. Each culture has its thing. So back to um, the, the, the song. I'm curious if you knew Saturday Night Live was going to be using the song for the Roxbury Guys sketch. Did you know? And what did you think about it when that came up? Well, I did know because Clive Davis uh, introduced me to um, to Lauren and all of the, the Saturday Night Live crew and SNL crew for today's audience and uh, went out with uh, to see Bette Midler in the evening and everyone got together and uh, we were just joking about some some things and uh, we got back to speaking about the wild and crazy guys of the 1980s and uh, Steve Martin and Dan Aykroyd and it was it was all a joke, you know, we were just having a good laugh about it. And then three weeks later, I get a phone call that they want to use What Is Love for a skit on Side Night Live. And what do you say? You say, yes, 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 please. <laughs> so, but it's all, again, it's all from Clive. Clive did a great job. So, so the sketch goes well. They decide to make the movie Night at the Roxbury. And the, and the song becomes iconic all over again. Yeah. Yeah. Thank God. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, 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 and now there's a whole like new generation of people who were introduced to the song who hadn't known the song before. Well, you know, today we have all this amazing communication of the internet and YouTube and all, all of that. But um, I'm always impressed um, that one generation can take over another. Uh, how would you say it's, it's like today's uh, generation would could be complaining about uh, the baby boomers. But yet they're loving what the Generation X was doing. And uh, we're still very happy about that. I'm still very happy about that. Well, it's funny because, um, you know, my, my son who's 14 and, and he is a musician and he listens to a lot of different genres. And I when I told him that you were going to be on the show, it was funny because he, he I like I it, it, like two days later, he goes, thanks, Dad. He goes, that song's been running in my head now for two straight days. <laughs> because that's the that's the beauty of that song. It's got, it's Thank such you. an earworm. Thank you. you know what I mean? It's like, Thank once you. you have it, it's and it's just a feel-good song. It just sticks with you. And I, I think that goes to as a testament to the hook in the song, too. You know what I mean? Well, it's, it's crazy. Uh, what is love and life has uh, two very strong courses. And um, for those of you who forgot that we're supposed to be singing and enjoying ourselves on this planet instead of complaining and bitching about everything. Um, I, I think they should listen to What Is Love a little bit more. So you, you, let's talk about life. Your single life also found success around the world. Um, what was the story behind that song? Well, it, it, life will never be the same. Life is changing. It's, a pretty, it's kind of a, a Confucius situation where you're getting older and you're learning that... Um, Everything that you believe will always stay the same. It doesn't, you know, and uh, it's it's evolving into something greater than you. It's, it's not just about you. And, um, yeah, stay positive and uh, go with the flow. So who's, whose idea was it for the music video for life? <sighs> I, was, <laughs> I was looking at a Queen video and I was looking at certain, certain uh, um Little epics, epics uh, cut scenes from uh, Metropolis, the old movie, you know, from the 1920s. And um, I just, it was Radio Gaga, if you remember. All we hear is, is Radio yeah. Gaga. And I was looking at the video and I thought, oh, I would love to do a bit of Metropolis. So I, I did have looking it up and I spoke to my video director. He's originally from Venezuela. And we had a long talk. And he says, yeah, we can do that. But it was the hardest video I've ever shot till today because I had to be, I was an actor and I was kind of the Dr. Frankenstein all the way through the video and we ended up shooting about 30 hours. Dr. Frankenstein in leather and a cool hat. <laughs> Someone's got to do it. <laughs> so um, do you have um, a, a song that, whether it be yours or somebody else's, that, that gives you joy every time you either sing it or play it? You know, when we were talking on the phone, um, I kind of had a few thoughts about all of that. I mean, in the old days, I used to do James Brown, uh, uh, Cameo, uh, Word Up, uh, uh, Prince, um, um, uh, Purple Rain, and even do a lot of rock, rock tracks. But I remember one of my favorite tracks that I love to do, and Marilyn Manson re redid it, Tainted oh. Love. Oh, so a soft sell. Yeah. 
Yeah. yeah. Sometimes I feel I've got to bump, bump. Away. <laughs> but I love the Marilyn Manson version. It's like, ah! It's, it's cool. <laughs> so is, is there a song outside of your hits that that you're like especially proud of? I, I know, I mean, well, I'll, I'll let you answer. Well, I, you know, in the lockdown now, I've been writing a lot of songs and I, I finished mastering um, 18 songs, but we still, we still have, uh, we did 12, 13 is going to the album for lucky number 13. Um, but I, I wrote 38, 38 tracks right now in the, in the last lockdown period. I didn't want to be just frozen and complaining. I just wanted to be busy. And uh, the new single, And Now, it's just released since uh, about 10 days. And now I'm very, very proud that I, I want a direction of music that caps a bit of my past and is uh, very much today. So um, I'm, I'm actually very happy with what I'm doing right now. Uh, what was a little bit of the process like of, of actually just sitting down and writing those songs? Well, I'm, I'm a person who loves relationships. I'm a person who loves the reality. I'm the person who loves, um, well, there's not a problem we can solve unless we work together. And my songs are generally around that. I do the human thing. And uh, um, yeah, there, there's, it's, it's a scary world today that pe people want to grab always these negative things People want to commit suicide in a video and talk about I'm going to kill myself and this and that. No, no, I'm completely the opposite. I'm about climbing the ladder altogether and being strong and, and, and not being alone and all those things. So let's talk about what's on the horizon for you. What should our audience be looking out for over the next few months uh, from you? And where can our viewers follow you these days? Is there a specific website? Is there certain social media? We can put it right up on the screen. Well, if you want to get in touch with me directly, you can. The best ways is like uh, Instagram, Hadaway Official, directly to me. But I have a good working corporate office. It's uh, info at HadawayChannel.com. But for music and all of the other good stuff, downloads from iTunes to Amazon Music, everyone's got it. Just buy it, please. <laughs> After we go to the break, uh, we're going to close out the show with uh, your video from N Now. Can you tell us a little bit about what the song means? Wow. Um, not another day alone at home. And now, not another day alone at home. That's it. You'll get it when you hear it. Hattie, thank you so much for joining us. Ladies and gentlemen, Hattaway. All the best. Bye-bye. That is our show for tonight. Thank you so much for watching. A very special thanks to Hadaway for joining us. Uh, taking us home tonight is Hadaway with his newest release, And Now.